Some gay YouTubers go on promoting a false narrative that there were gay Christians within the early church and that the church even conducted gay marriages. Let's take a look at this clip. LGBTQ Christians have existed since the beginning of Christian history. This might come as a surprise to you since many Christians claim that LGBTQ relationships are a modern invention. But LGBTQ people have existed since the beginning of history. And that means that LGBTQ Christians have existed since the beginning of Christian history. Early Christian martyrs Sergius and Bacchus are perhaps two of the first gay Christians whose story needs to be shared because Sergius and Bacchus walked so that Bob and Larry could run. Like him, many others believe that gay lifestyle was normal within the early church and gay marriages were not uncommon. They argue that it's only in the intermittent years church became more conservative and developed anti-LGBTQ sentiments. Are the claims made in this video true? What are the evidence in support of such a view? Let's look at these absurd claims and then the real story of the early Christian martyrs, Sergius and Bacchus. It's about time we decisively and once and for all debunk these non-historical fantasies that are paraded as real history, expose their ideological agenda with solid historical evidence from early Christian sources and from God's holy word. Welcome to Discern Scripture YouTube channel. We post videos regularly on various topics that are related to the biblical world, its history and its present relevance. We would really appreciate if you subscribe and help us reach a wider audience. Now let's get on with the video. In this video, the YouTuber repeatedly claims that Sergius and Bacchus were Roman soldiers practicing gays and they were secretly Christians. He says that they were united in a gay marriage ceremony called Adolfo Paiesis and was blessed by the church. When the Roman emperor found out, he tortured Sergius and Bacchus, paraded them in women's clothing and eventually killed them. They were faithful and loyal to each other until the very end. And so the gay propagandists, they promote the story of Sergius and Bacchus as the gay couple from the early church. Let's fact check these false claims. What is the real story of St. Bacchus and St. Sergius? Were they really a gay couple? Is there evidence for that? What does early church history tell us about these great saints of God who laid down their lives as martyrs for the holy name of Jesus Christ our Lord. The story of Sergius and Bacchus is recounted in the Passion of Sergius and Bacchus. The word passion comes from the Latin term passio. It means suffering. The Passion of Sergius and Bacchus is an account of their suffering and martyrdom for the sake of Christ. It portrays them as Roman soldiers who converted to Christianity during the reign of Emperor Galerius somewhere between AD 305 to 311. Despite their high rank and Roman citizenship, they faced persecution when their Christian faith and identity was discovered. The narrative details their refusal to participate in pagan rituals, which led to the public humiliation and torture and their eventual martyrdom. Sergius and Bacchus were initially striped of their military status. Sergius and Bacchus confessed that they considered Christ as Lord and themselves as his holy brides, and they would not partake in any pagan ritual. The Romans were infuriated and put on women's clothing on them to mock them for their Christian confession that they were the brides of Christ. They were dressed in women's clothing and paraded through the town as a form of public disgrace and humiliation. Then they were sent to Barbolisas in Mesopotamia to stand trial before Antiochus, a military commander and a friend of Sergius. Despite Antiochus' attempt to persuade them to renounce Christianity, they remained steadfast in their faith. St. Bacchus was beaten to death and was martyred first. It was told that Bacchus appeared to Sergius after his death, encouraging him to stay strong in his faith. Sergius too underwent brutal torture and was eventually beheaded in the city of Rasafa in present-day Syria. The memory of St. Sergius and St. Bacchus is venerated among the Arab Christians, and their shrine in Rasafa became the major pilgrimage center during the time of the Byzantine Empire, and the city itself 
came to be known as Sergio Polis. An ancient church dedicated to their memory in the city of Malola, Syria, was destroyed by Islamic militants just recently, along with the rare 13th century icons of the two saints. Catholics and Orthodox Christians continue to celebrate the lives of these brave martyrs on the October 7th. When we investigate where does this story of Sergius and Bacchus being gay come from, it leads us to John Boswell, a gay historian from Yale. He was the first person to twist the history of Sergius and Bacchus and turn them into gay symbols. In his book, Same-Sex Unions in Pre-Modern Europe, published in 1994, Boswell argued that Sergius and Bacchus' relationship can be understood as having a romantic dimension. He laid out two most controversial claims. They were practicing gays and Christians. They were united in a gay marriage ceremony named as Adolfo Poiesis. Both of his claims were highly criticized by the rest of the academic world. Boswell's research methodology and assumptions were questioned and his conclusions were universally rejected as without having any historical basis by serious academic scholars. Regardless of the rejection by the academia, in the wake of Boswell's work, Sergius and Bacchus have become popularly celebrated within the gay community. A 1994 icon of Sergius and Bacchus, and this has become a popular gay symbol since then. Now let's go over John Boswell's two claims and make an assessment. Claim number one, Adolfo Poiesis is equivalent to gay marriage. Boswell claimed that Sergius and Bacchus were united in a gay marriage ceremony called Adolfo Poiesis. Is that true? Now, Adolfo Poiesis is a term that literally means Adolfos, which is brothers, and Poyo, which is making. Literally, this compound word means brother making. The word Adolfos has always been used in Greek language to refer to non-sexual relationships within families, between siblings. Adolfo poiesis is very different from the pederastic sexual relationship that were practiced in the Roman society during that time. In pederastic relationship, older males used younger males for their sexual pleasure and groomed them in their sin. Adolfo poiesis is the opposite of that sinful practice. It was like having a godfather or godmother figure, a mentor-mentee relationship, where a mature Christian believer would guide the younger believer in Christ to grow in the ways of God. Claudine Rapp, a German scholar on the Byzantine Empire, she addressed this specific issue in her book, Brother Making in Late Antiquity and Byzantium. This is what she says. The ecclesiastical ritual of brother making was not formulated with a view to include a sexual dimension. Yes, this does not include a sexual dimension. Adolfo Poiesis was not a gay marriage equivalent in antiquity. Sergius and Bacchus were Adolfo Poiesis. They were like family, brothers in Christ. Even today, we use the term brothers and sisters without sexual connotation within the Christian church to address fellow believers. When someone is a brother in Christ, we treat them with special kindness and affection in the church as we would treat a real family member. We, we look up to the mature senior members of the congregation as a guide, as mentors, and elder brothers in Christ. This affection is completely devoid of any sexual connotation. The claim that the early church was tolerant and conducted gay marriage is completely a blatant attempt to falsify known history and rewrite history without any factual basis. Boswell, being gay, pushed this dishonest gay agenda to tarnish and corrupt the holy Christian brotherhood between Sergius and Bacchus and infuse their holy history of martyrdom with his perverted gay ideology and desecrated their holy memory. Second claim, practicing gays were accepted within the early church. John Boswell also claimed that Sergius and Bacchus were practicing gays and believing Christians at the same time. He showed that the early Christianity was tolerant and accommodating such various romantic relationships. This is another major distortion of history. Boswell had effectively downplayed the sodomy laws and the strict anti-homosexual teachings that were present 
in the early church. Around the same time when Sergius and Bacchus were martyred, the church council of Ancyra took place in AD 314. The church council had strong words against the deviant sexual practices and homosexuality. Canon 16 and 17, this is what it says. If anyone 20 years of age shall commit sodomy, let him fast 15 years. After 15 years, he will be readmitted to the communion of prayer. Then after remaining five years in that communion, let them receive the Holy Communion. This is how church attempted to reform sexual perverts and homosexuals. They had to fast and do penance for 15 years and then another five more years before they were allowed to partake in the Holy Communion. If these men who engaged in homosexuality were above 40 or 50, they had to penance for the rest of their lives to be reformed from these sinful practices. These sodomy laws within the church were strongly countercultural. This completely destroys the claim that the early church was tolerant to the gays and included practicing gays in their congregation and conducted gay marriages. No, early church rejected deviant homosexual practices and encouraged the faithful to abstain from and reject such abominable worldly lifestyles. Let me provide some references from the early church fathers and text. This will help us understand the attitude of the early Christians toward homosexuals in general. Let me briefly cite five sources. Didache, Clement of Alexandria, Eusebius of Caesarea, John Chrysostom, and Augustine. Now, Didache is also known as the teaching of the 12 apostles. It's a late first century document. This is what it says. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit pederasty. You shall not commit fornication. It equates pederasty or homosexuality with adultery and fornication, a sin to restrain from. Clement of Alexandria, in his work, The Instructor, this is what he says. In accordance with these remarks, conversation about the deeds of wickedness is appropriately termed filthy speaking as talk about adultery and pederasty and the like. Eusebius of Caesarea, the first historian of the church, wrote this, having forbidden all unlawful marriage and all unseemly practice and the union of women with women and men with men, God adds, do not defile yourself with any of these things. The instruction of Eusebius is clear. Do not defile and pollute yourself and pollute the land with these ungodly gay and lesbian lifestyles. John Chrysostom, one of the finest preachers of the early church and also the Archbishop of Constantinople, this is what he said. Certain men in the church come in gazing about the beauty of women, others curious about the blooming youth of boys. After this, do you not marvel that lightning bolts are not launched from heaven and all these things are not plucked up from their foundations? For worthy both of thunderbolts and hell are the things that are done. But God, who is long-suffering and of great mercy, forbears a while his wrath, calling you to repentance and amendment. Bishop Chrysostom says that homosexual lust would invite divine judgment. Those indulge in it have to repent and make changes to their lifestyle before the judgment falls. Augustine of Hippo, one of the best theologians of the early church, this is what he said about homosexuality. Those shameful acts against nature, such as were committed in Sodom, are everywhere and always be detested and punished. If all nations were to do such things, they would be held guilty of the same crime by the law of God, which has not made men so that they should use one another in this way. Augustine called homosexuality and natural something to be detested and abstained from. From these references, we can clearly understand that the early church did did not entertain or affirm homosexual practice within the church. Church was ecclesia, people who are called out of darkness, out of sin and out of wickedness into the holy body of Christ, committing to live holy lives in repentance and obedience to God's word, rejecting the sinful lifestyles promoted by the world. We must remember one more important fact during the time of Sergius and Bacchus. The Christian church was undergoing tremendous persecution at the hands of the Romans. Only those who were deeply committed to follow Christ were present in the church. 
those who want to enjoy the wanton pleasures and preterastic sexual lifestyle, they stayed out of the church, unwilling to submit themselves to such rigorous morality and dangerously precarious life. Let me remind you of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Some of you were like this in the past. Yes, some of the early Christians came from such sinful lifestyles. Some of them were sexually immoral. Some of them were idolaters. Some of them were adulterous. Some of them were homosexuals. But they repented and turned around from their life of sinful perversion. They left their adulterous and homosexual ways behind for good and turned themselves to follow Christ, taking up their crosses daily. There were no practicing homosexuals in the early church, but perhaps those who left those dark habits behind. To claim that early church allowed an encouraged homosexual lifestyle is completely against all known history and the careful study of the biblical data and the church history. John Boswell has simply concocted this demented narrative about Sergius and Bacchus under the spell of demonic influence. His claims have no factual basis in history. In fact, Boswell's dishonesty was exposed by Camellia Paglia. This is what she wrote in the review of Boswell's book. Surely, bonding ceremonies are of special interest to feudalism, a word that occurs just once here and only in the footnotes. Boswell has no feeling or sympathy for military or political relationships, which distorts his portrait of medieval society. Indeed, he seems grotesquely incapable of imagining any enthusiasm or intimate bond among men that is not overtly or covertly homosexual. There lies the problem. Boswell sees everything through the prism of gay homosexual relationship and equates normal platonic relationship between Sergius and Bacchus with homosexual marriage. Camellia Paglia promptly exposed his ideological leanings and his gay agenda. Now here is my closing reflection. In his book, Four Loves, C.S. Lewis says this about love. Those who cannot conceive friendship as a substantive love, but only as a disguise or elaboration of eros, betray the fact that they have never had a friend. The problem with gays is that they want to sexualize every human relationship. In many cultures, men holding hands is simply normal and acceptable. There is no sexual suggestion there. It's pure friendship. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 and 12, Paul tells the brothers to greet one another with a holy kiss. There is nothing sexual there. On the other hand, gay interpretation projects their abnormal sexual fantasies into normal lives of biblical characters. In their view, the relationship between David and Jonathan involved homosexual aspect. In the similar manner, they conceptualized Sergius and Bacchus to be gay couple from the early centuries. As we have seen, this is completely made up by Boswell and without any historical basis. Gay propagandists over-sexualize innocent, non-sexual human relationship and have an overt preoccupation with gay relationships. Their skewed view of human relationship sure need to be corrected. On the other hand, several disciples and early Christian leaders are remembered as pairs for their ministerial functions, Peter and Paul. Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Timothy. There are also quite a number of traditionally paired saints in Eastern Orthodox iconography. So Zima and Savati, Cosmas and Damian, Flores and Lauras, and so on. Cyril and Methodius, they spread Christianity in Russia and Serbia. In all these cases, we consider them as men who stood side by side in their witnessing to the Lord and in the work of God's kingdom. Firm believers like Sergius and Bacchus, they laid down their lives as martyrs for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Their faith in Christ continues to inspire all of us. 
Roman Emperor Justinian I built a church and dedicated to these two saints, honoring their faith, perseverance, and the love for Jesus Christ. The Church of Saints Sergius and Bacchus is also known as Little Hagia Sophia is located in Istanbul, Turkey. Sadly, it is now turned into a mosque by the Islamic invaders who took over the region. Devil is a conniving schemer. He takes that which is holy and God-honoring and then subverts it into something unholy and detestable before the Lord. John Boswell did devil's handiwork and wrote extensively to popularize and legitimize the gay lifestyle. He was writing with an agenda to rewrite history. He rewrote the martyrdom accounts of Sergius and Bacchus as that of gay. Shortly after that, he died from HIV AIDS infection, something that he contracted from his gay lifestyle. Let this be clear. God doesn't accept sin as normal. Bible never supports sin, be it adultery or homosexuality. The Christian church that stands on the foundation of God's word should never condone sin. God's answer to prideful, unrepentant sin is judgment. The wages of sin is death. But Jesus took the wrath of God on himself on the cross and made a way for us to escape this divine judgment. By believing in him, by accepting him as our Lord and Savior, we can experience grace and eternal life. Jesus calls all sinners to draw near to him in holy fear and repentance that we may receive mercy, forgiveness, cleansing, acceptance, and eternal life from the Lord. Let us all move away from the life of sin and slavery to that of truth, freedom, abundant joy, and eternal hope in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you for watching this video. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do subscribe and support our channel. Click on the bell icon so that you can get notification whenever we post a new video. Also, feel free to leave your thoughts and questions in the comment section below. God bless you all. Shalom.